The small town of Gurkha in western Nepal has given its name to the soldiers of the famous Gurkha regiments. Nepal is a long, narrow land of rugged hills stretching more than 500 miles between India and Tibet. Until a few years ago, it was closed to all foreign travelers. And even today, many of its people have never seen Europeans. Last year, an expedition led by Professor Heimendorf, an anthropologist of London University, set out to study the inhabitants of some of the remoter parts of Nepal and to visit the Gurkha soldiers in their villages. He and his wife were the only two Europeans in the party. There are no roads as we know them, no railways. Everything needed for months of marching has to be carried on the backs of porters. For days on end, the track winds through terraced rice fields, dry and parched during the early months of the year. Gurkha, once the capital of the hill chiefs who later became kings of Nepal, is today a sleepy little place. The worship of gods in the pagoda-like temples and the people's life in their homes has seen little change for hundreds of years. Old women spin as their grandmothers did. And one of the few mechanical contrivances is a tilt hammer for pounding grain. Only the large red brick palace of Gurkha, now mouldering away, recalls the glory of past ages. Its delicately carved wooden windows are the work of craftsmen who were attracted by the royal court. They have long since vanished, but Gurkha soldiers in the black uniforms of the Nepal militia guard the ancient palace. And the clerks occupying its chilly rooms often move their desks and files into the warm sun. A soldier on leave from a British regiment watches them. For him, there's little else to do in a place where the women are busy with their housework and washing clothes in an open well. And the men have to go to their fields carrying on their shoulders not a rifle, but a wooden plow. The Kurung tribesmen, who fill the ranks of so many Gorkha regiments, are sturdy farmers. In a land devoid of level ground, they score terraced fields out of these steep hill slopes and work the stony ground with their light wooden plow. On the higher terraces, they grow summer crops of millet and maize, from which they make bread and porridge and brew beer. Perhaps unknowingly in some cases, they are wasteful of their homeland's natural resources. They mercilessly rob the trees of every leafy branch in order to feed their cattle at a time when all the grass has dried up. The Gurungs keep large flocks of sheep for wool and meat. In the winter, these flocks remain in the lower valleys, where they graze on the rice stubble. But when spring comes, the shepherds move with them to the higher pastures. These men live for months in the high mountains, their only homes being simple shelters of cloth spread over bamboo frames. On feast days, all the people congregate in the villages. During one month of the year, a strange ritual takes place when parties of girls work themselves up into a religious trance. They are then believed to be possessed by a spirit, a goddess. <laughs> In this
this way, the supernatural becomes part of everyday life, and the gods and goddesses of Nepal make their presence felt in the remotest villages to the simplest of people. <laughs> feast follows the dance. It is served in the open on a stone paved terrace. Men who have dined for years in a regimental mess, who've tried Chinese food in Hong Kong and drunk wine in Italian restaurants, now sit happily on the floor and enjoy a simple meal of rice and heavily spiced sauce. They have known the world of the machine age, but they return quite contentedly to the simple hard life of hill peasants. What a Gurkha soldier has learned during his service in the British Army, he cannot employ in his home. He may have been a lorry driver, but in a country without roads or any source of power, his mechanical knowledge is useless. Yet these veterans return to their mountain homes without becoming misfits. They seldom attain or even appear to wish for positions of real leadership. From the hill villages of the Gurungs, within sight of the lofty Annapurna range, the expedition turns east towards Kathmandu. As one approaches Nepal's capital, foot traffic increases. Thousands of porters carrying foodstuffs and live poultry converge on the city. In the late morning, Heimendorf and his party stop to cook a meal which must sustain them until evening. In three days' time, they will reach the great town of Kathmandu. The valley enclosing Kathmandu has been a center of urban civilizations for well over a thousand years. Most of the inhabitants are neighbors, a race of town dwellers utterly different from the rustic hillmen. They have produced great artists and craftsmen, and the town is dotted with sculptures of gods, of men, and of beasts. Trade flourishes in the crowded bazaars, which for many centuries have been meeting places for the Nepalese, Indians, and Tibetans. In recent years, radio and cinema have also brought Western influences to Kathmandu. The genius of the neighbors, a gay, artistic, and excitable people, expresses itself best in the great festivals in honor of their gods. These feasts reach a climax in multitudinous processions when the images of gods are carried from square to square under ornate umbrellas, and idols inhabiting separate temples are made to meet, surrounded by surging crowds of worshippers. Under each twirling umbrella is the precious gilt image of a god carried on the shoulders of worshippers, who are whipped into a trance-like frenzy by the beating of drums and the mad shouting of the multitude. Most of the spectators are women. No woman dares to mingle with a throng of excited men but all the girls want to watch. The gods involved in this turmoil are Hindu deities. More than half of the neighbors profess the Hindu religion. The others are Buddhists, but they too join in the excitement of the Hindu festivals and pay homage to the great Hindu gods of the Kathmandu Valley. In contrast, the Buddhist temples rise in serene isolation above the noise and bustle of Kathmandu. Statues of the Buddha Sakyamuni, shaded by ancient trees, flank the approaches leading to the great sanctuary of Swayambhu. painted in black, red, and white on the pinnacle of the shrine, look down upon the stream of pilgrims coming from distant valleys on Nepal's northern border. Many are ragged figures, but all are eager to acquire religious merit by turning the metal prayer wheels and walking at least three times around the great shrine. A priest with a silver tray places offerings of rice and coconut 
into a niche of the shrine. And this is the moment one of the sacred monkeys has been waiting for. Two Buddhist deities watch, indifferent to the monkey's theft. Pilgrims from the high regions of eastern Nepal leave the great sanctuary and the expedition too sets out on a long trek towards the east with Darjeeling in India as its objective, still months of marching away. Twenty porters carry equipment, tents and basic provisions. At the end of a day's march, the tents are pitched near a village. It's a settlement of the Tamang tribe of Hillman, lying three days journey east of Kathmandu. The well-built houses, painted white and apricot, are not huddled together, but separated by their owner's fields. At the foot of a small hill stands a Buddhist temple, and the prayer flags flutter in front of people's houses. Sheaves of maize hang under the eaves to dry. Men gather to gossip beneath a holy flag with Buddhist prayers printed on it. The village is the home of several artists, and an old lama explains the meaning of one of the religious paintings. Even small boys learn to decorate drums in bright colors. In the middle of ranges of Nepal's eastern hills, each day means long climbs and steep descents, for the east-west route cuts across every river and many a mountain range. Villages are tiny and far between, but now and then the travelers pass a small temple. Here, a solitary shrine, rather neglected, offers refreshment to the thirsty porters. Exquisite stone carvings adorn its walls. Who carved them? There's no one to ask. A few days pass. Slowly, the vegetation changes as the Ekron reaches a region lying above 8,000 feet. There are forests of pine and rhododendron, ranging in color from near white to deep rose. The ground is studded with mauve primulas. Patches of snow linger in shady hollows higher up, where the shrub rhododendrons are not yet in flower. One of the porters samples the cool snow. Mrs. Heimendorf has been on many similar expeditions and finds little difficulty in marching at 12,000 feet. Through dense pine and rhododendron forest, the path drops into the wide, open valley of Solu. At an altitude of nearly 10,000 feet, large and prosperous Sherpa villages stand amidst cultivated fields. The inhabitants are the people who have helped so many expeditions to attack Mount Everest. At some distance from the village, surrounded by fields, is a Buddhist monument, a stupa commemorating a great lama. A freestanding stone gateway marks the entrance to the village. Nearby, is the courtyard of the three-storied temple. The colorful frescoes on the walls and ceilings of the temple depict the Buddhas of past and future ages and some of the divinities of the Buddhist heaven. From Solu, the party moves on to the valley of the Dudkosi River. After walking some hours in the early morning, the custom is to halt near a stream or a river at about 10 o'clock and allow the porters time to cook their food, to eat at leisure and to wash their clothes.
The Drood Kosi is crossed by a rickety bridge of logs, which every year is washed away during the monsoon and replaced when the river subsides. Turning north, they spent several days moving, travelling through a narrow gorge where inscriptions of Tibetan prayers are carved on rock, especially the famous repeated prayer, Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum. A last steep climb leads from the narrow gorge up to the large village of Namche Bazaar, a Sherpa settlement built onto a steep hillside. Behind are the snow peaks of the Himalayas. Here, the party is among friends, familiar from a previous expedition. And when they continue their journey to Darjeeling, the Heimendorfs are given a tremendous send-off, with perhaps more than just one for the road. Leave-taking among Sherpas is an occasion for large quantities of liquor and beer to be pressed on the travellers, and wishes for a safe journey are accompanied by the presentation of white ceremonial scarves. For several days, the track leads through Sherpa country. But to avoid a mountain range, impassable for heavily laden porters, the party has to descend once again to an area of subtropical forests. Here, lush and leafy vegetation with curtains of lianas and climbing plants covers every inch of the mountainside. This country is remote from all communications, and many of the villages have never been visited by Europeans. Their inhabitants belong to the Rai tribe, a mongoloid people living in a world that has remained unchanged for hundreds of years. After weeks in country too high to grow food of any kind, it was pleasant to be surrounded by banana and orange trees. The unhurried rhythm of village life is broken only by an occasional feast or a marriage, when men wearing headdresses of hawk's feathers dance to the rhythm of drums. clothed in white, is carried from his house and placed onto an improvised hammock. Rice is thrown at the bride, a girl several years older than her young bridegroom, whose forehead is now plastered with rice and red paste to bring good fortune. In the valley of the Arun River, which flowing north to south cuts through the whole breadth of Nepal, there's a small group of villages different from all the rest of the country. For here the houses and granaries are built on wooden poles, and getting out of one's house means climbing down a ladder. Women weave homespun cloth. The rise do not depend on trade. Nearly everything they need grows or is made in their own country. Farther upstream, the Arun Valley narrows, but there seems to be no way of getting over to the east bank of the river. A single rope spanning the river serves the local people as a bridge, but for those unused to acrobatics, it would have been foolhardy to attempt such a crossing. 
In any case, the loads could hardly have been got from one bank to another in this way. But a day's journey farther on, there's a cane bridge, not very well kept, and swaying frighteningly as the porters carry their heavy loads across it. Such bridges are used until they finally break and then a new bridge is built of cane and bamboo. People often get hurt or even killed, for anyone falling into the rushing waters of the Arun has little chance of survival. Even Mrs. Heimendorf finds it best to take her boots off. Eventually, everyone gets safely across, and the party moves up the eastern slope towards the Tibetan border. The first people they meet describe themselves as car boaters. They, and in fact the whole population on both sides of the Arun Gorge, seem to be a mixture of a local tribe and immigrant Tibetans. Their huddled villages are not so well planned and spaced out as the Sherpa ones. Women are busy with the harvest of a small variety of millet. This is their main crop. There's more than enough to eat as well as to use for brewing beer. At this time of the year, they and the children spend most of their days in the harvest fields. They cut off the ears of grain with small sickles, and once the basket is full, it is taken straight to the thrashing floor. Cattle, bred from Indian stock, graze among the stubble. Buddhist monuments stand alongside the village paths, but Buddhism and an older tribal religion are here mixed up and the men who describe themselves as lamas are really spirit callers and priests of local gods. Bejeweled women are waiting for a harvest dance to begin. There's a large vat of millet beer on the edge of the dance floor, and from this the priests first suck up the strongly alcoholic drink. These dance figures and steps seem very simple, but they are in fact very difficult to learn. The people play no musical instruments, but accompany their dances with chants. No one stops the children drinking the beer when they feel like it. Before long, the dancers get pretty tipsy. Even so, their steps never falter. With plenty of beer, a handful of straw, and occasional rests, they keep going for hours. <laughs> Deep gorges separate this village from Tudam, the last settlement on Nepalese soil before the Tibetan frontier. Its inhabitants make a living almost entirely from the manufacture of incense, a commodity for which the Tibetan monasteries provide a large market and pay well. Simple water-driven mills grind the wood of the juniper tree to pulp, a block of juniper wood being attached to a crankshaft and rubbed on a rough stone. 
This pulp is then dried and sold to Tibetan traders who fetch it with caravans of yaks. Traders come with unladen beasts and pay for the juniper pulp in coin. Then, heavily loaded, the caravans return to Tibet. Tudam is the starting point of the crossing of the mountain range which divides the Arun Basin from that of the Tamar River. The only route across that high range leads over a pass which is already under snow. With the autumn well advanced, there's always a danger that winter weather will close the passes. In a matter of hours, routes can become blocked. The men hired at Tudam as porters and guides were proving unreliable. Suddenly, they refused to advance. With little money left and less food, the Heimendorfs were in a dangerous position. But the promise of treble pay eventually swayed the Tudam men and they decided to take the risk. There's little sign of a track, and the country grows wilder and more desolate as the party plods on. Ice pinnacles stand to left and right, and the air becomes bitterly cold. It isn't difficult to get lost in this wilderness of ice and rock, and every hour counts. Nobody, not even the porters and guides, is certain of the track. Walls of ice block the way. When they do get through, they face an even more dangerous obstacle. This torrent rushing over a bed of green, solid ice. A slip here will be fatal. There's a great sense of relief as they make camp that night. The porters build their fires with the last of the wood which they've carried with them since they left the tree line many days ago. Ahead lies the easy valley of the Tamar River and the route to Darjeeling and India. The journey across the length of Nepal is at its end. Thank you.